This podcast is now a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. For more information and a great guide to Alberta podcasts, you can check out the website at albertapodcastnetwork.com or look us up on Instagram, Twitter, or I think any social media out there. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. This episode of My Viewfinder is brought to you by the inaugural Yeg Podfest, presented by Edmonton Community Foundation in partnership with the Alberta Podcast Network and LitFest, Canada's nonfiction festival. Running October 1st through 3rd, the festival will be held entirely online this year, so anyone can experience it. Events will include master classes with experts, panel discussions, feature interviews, and more. Some of APN's podcasters will be part of these events with guests from around the world. To find out more, head to yegpodfest.ca. That's Y E G P O D F E S T.ca and sign up to receive updates. Hello and welcome, weary podcast traveler. This is My Viewfinder. This is David Yun, and this is my podcast called My Viewfinder. I'm looking to get some of the root questions behind why we photographers do what we do. To start off this series, I'll be releasing weekly episodes from now on. And just to get us started off on the right foot, I'm going to start with a conversation completely outside of photography. I called my friend Nick Olkovich. Nick and I went to school together many years ago when I pretended to be a philosophy major. Nick actually kept going to class, and now he has multiple degrees, and he's the Assistant Professor of Theology and Philosophy at St. Mark's College in Vancouver. I called Nick because I was interested in imagery and iconography, and while I probably should seek out some art historians and people who study aesthetics, I thought what better place to start than the use of imagery in religion. Nick's got a fascinating perspective, both in his field and in our discussion, as he's influenced by more contemporary writings, particularly that of Bernard Lonergan, a Jesuit priest and philosopher who, if I understand this correctly, sought to work with both rational, empirical data and spiritual experiences of the unintelligible, something he called critical realism. Seeing as we were schoolmates, I probably talked too much in this conversation, but uh, have a listen. I think in conclusion, imagery, it seems, is influenced by cultural context. It can be gateways into a greater sense of fulfillment and, dare I say, a spiritual connection to our world. All right, brother, I'm at your I'm at your disposal. Yeah, let's talk. uh, Let's talk. How about? uh, how about we do a brief introduction? I don't even know what your official your official title is right now. So, yeah, I'm talking to my old friend Nick Olkovich. But what, what do you do now, Nick? Uh, yeah, I uh, thank you for having me, Dave. Uh, I I uh, I so I teach uh, religious studies and theology at uh, St. Mark's College and Corpus Christi College uh, at the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver. Um, it's sort of the Catholic college at the university of British Columbia. Uh, and I've been here about three years. I, so I'm an assistant professor and I hold the Marie Anne Blondin chair in Catholic theology. Um, yeah. And so I teach it both at the undergraduate level and also at the uh, graduate level. Nick and I went to school together. Uh, Nick actually went to class and I just waited for him at the bars. So, uh, Nick got a degree, <laughs> Two, three, three of them. And uh, four, four, fuck, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, and as far as I know, you are not a photographer. I am not, no, no, okay. So, uh, the reason I want to talk to you actually, Nick, is because you're a philosopher uh, rather than a photographer, if, if I'm allowed to say that. Uh, I don't know, would you consider yourself a theologian more than a philosopher? I'd say I'm probably working in the at the margins of both. So I'm not really a good philosopher and I'm not really a good theologian. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's perfect then for this conversation. We don't want too much credibility. Uh, yeah, actually, the reason why I want to talk to you, other than uh, just catching up, is, uh, you know, working in photography now, as I am, images have become a very powerful thing. And uh, with some of the reading I've been doing, 
looking at sort of the evolution and the history of imagery, um, I thought it would be interesting to get your take from both a philosophical and a religious perspective of how imagery, iconography, and ultimately idolatry, if we want to say that, uh, figure into, uh, well, just figure at all, um, so that I can kind of take that back and reflect on what I think is an interesting thing that's happening with photography, which is uh, that it's building this language of, I, I think it's like worship. And uh, if I'm allowed to be cynical about it, kind of false idolatry, <laughs> although that makes me sound very Catholic, um, mostly false in the sense that uh, I think that the representation through photographs of what reality is supposed to be is really uh, confusing people's ability to stay both sort of, uh, if not rational, at least balanced. Um, and, uh, and it's reflecting a lot on how people uh, live with themselves, interact with others. Because I think it's got a huge social impact. But um, pre-photography, and so more in your realm, sort of, I mean, not that you studied uh, imagery in itself, but, um, you know, through the course of religious thinking, uh, imagery has been really... Like at the, it's, it's a crucial part of it, I think. Um, I don't think people spend so much time just memorizing the text. I mean, a large majority of religious history, people have been illiterate. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, anything uh, come to mind, as it were? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, so I think it's a fascinating topic. I think that um, there's a lot going on there. I, I you know, I was... In preparation for our discussion, I sort of thought about a couple of, you know, themes and the way in which they may be related. And I can say a little bit about that as a way to jump in and we can see where that goes, I guess. I mean, I think um, for me, as someone who hasn't really studied art or, you know, the history of art or, you know, sort of, as you said, imagery in itself, um, you know, I, I'm coming at this question from a particular perspective and I think the phrase that I would use um, is the question of sort of sacramentality um, in the Catholic tradition and, and in the broader sort of Christian uh, uh, tradition. Um, and what exactly do we mean by that? Um, well, I mean, one way to think about um, the nature of sacrament, I mean, St. Augustine, you know, goes way back, uh, you know, and sort of says, well, a sacrament is a visible sign of invisible grace, right? It's a visible sign of you know, sort of sacred mystery, um, that it discloses something uh, beyond the image itself, if we're going to use image as an example um, of that. And the clearest example, I think, in the Christian tradition of this sort of sacramentality of images would be Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ um, is sort of the you know, sort of visible image of the invisible God, right? Um, and in that sense, Jesus Christ is the sort of primordial sacrament of God in human history, um, discloses in a unique and particular way, and in a definitive way, at least in the in the Christian uh, sort of uh, from the Christian perspective, uh, something of the of the God who remains invisible, ultimately who remains mystery, um, and sort of that incarnational principle um, that sort of says, well, yeah, you know, God enters into human history in a real live human being, and you know, the 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 invisible becomes visible. Well, that's a principle that that's that's then sort of taken up by you know, Christians um, in the early church. And it's, it, I mean, it's not unrelated, I think, to the Jewish sort of mindset, right? The Jewish imagination that sort of says God is ultimately utterly transcendent, but God is ultimately also, uh, you know, imminent in uh, actions and events and people, places, images um, in the everyday world in which we live. And that there's a tension between those two things. The transcendent God made visible in and through the visible, the material realities, the, the infinite made sort of uh, visible and present in the finite, uh, you know, and sort of idolatry sort of cuts that tension and, so, and sort of says, well, it's just the image. It, you know, it doesn't point to anything beyond itself. Um, whereas the sort of sacramental mindset thinks of, yeah, images, I mean, you know, or actions or places in, in the broader sense, but we're, we're focusing on images today. But yeah, an, an image, for example, or what we might call an icon, right? Very typical in the sort of Eastern tradition, to speak of icons, yeah, we can speak of an image of Christ or an icon of Christ in terms of sacramentality, right? As a visible sign that mediates uh, something deeper, right? Um, that points beyond itself, right? 
Um, Mircea Eliade, the sort of famous um, you know, scholar of religion, will talk about um, the way in which images or symbols in different cultures and different religious traditions you know, can, be, can function as doors to the sacred, right? As sort of um, hier- hierophanies or theophanies, right? That point beyond themselves, that disclose sacred meaning, a sacred world, sacred time um, that is beyond them. Um, and I think that's the way that Christians have come to think about everything in the world as, po- as potentially mediating an encounter with a mystery, but images in a particular way. And, and as you said, something around, you know, literacy and Ill- illiteracy, you know, in the history of the church, I mean, yeah, for, for you know, for centuries and centuries, um, you know, the icon functioned really as, as a text, right? For those who couldn't re- break open the word, um, at least they could encounter, for example, God in and through icons. Um, and, um, yeah, that's one way to start. I don't know if that's helpful. That's great. I was just thinking the podcast form is great because this is probably the first conversation we've had where we don't talk over each other. Yeah? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and get upset and just start yelling. <laughs> no, we're older and wiser now, so that's probably why I can listen more deeply. <laughs> No, it's great. I mean, the one thing I might have to do for our conversation is start defining some of the philosophical terms that, you know, I, I want to say we, but I, I'm definitely not in this field uh, specifically, but that we take kind of for granted, you know, like what we mean by uh, transcendent and uh, sacrament, like, you know, you know how philosophy can be. It gets so semantic, semantical, if that's a word. Um, and, uh, and I mean, you're bringing up largely the Christian uh, perspective because that's kind of where you normally sit, I think. So um, there'll be a tone. Uh, but I think if we move out of that, one of the, one of the things that I, what I like, I mean, I'm just thinking about when you brought up icon um, and creating something. I mean, do you think that there's an intent in icon creation to... Um, I don't know, control or form or uh, or uh, or frame even like the general populace. You know, uh, is an icon created inherently through worship, or is it something there's a politic there's a politicization or whatever the right word is? Is there something political? Do you think where um, you know, in in your case, the the long dominant Catholic hierarchy would make a decision to create an effigy? of, you know, whether it's something as uh, peaceful and benign as Mary to, you know, uh, depictions of the torment of sin. Um, you know, there must be some intent. And in that intent, I think, lies some of the things that I fear about photography, which is uh, that there's a bit of, contr- there's a bit of control. Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you know me, I'm, I'm always kind of cynical and, and talk too much, but, um, you know, I, if I want to be optimistic, then we want to say that we create icons to bring hope and grace to a group of people that may not be able to read it in a text or spend enough time as an elite uh, thinker might have, you know, sitting on a languidly on a couch, um, contemplating the mysteries of the universe. If you're a, a serf or a, a laborer, you know, in the dark ages, you, you don't get to do that. Um, but if you are given an, a, a, a picture a painting or a little figurine, then all of a sudden, like you're saying, there's so, there's something that can point to a mystery that you don't even need to think about so much. You can just take it on faith. Um, I think that stuff's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, so uh, let me circle back to the question around, uh, you know, the sort of the nature of the political in the production of imagery. Um, I, I, just to sort of maybe say a little bit more about that last point that you made. Um, yeah, I think it, it's this idea that um, in and through, uh, you know, the viewing of an icon or the, the viewing of a sort of religious art, um, as I said, I described that as a sort of a, a potentially a door to the sacred and, and the, the, the world that, it, you know, the sort of sacred meaning that is disclosed in and through the viewing is received purely as gift, at least in the, in the Christian perspective. It's something that, that, that comes to one in and through um, the viewing itself. It's not, so it's not a production of the mind, in a sense, right? Um, it's received purely as gift. And, and, and at least in a Christian context, when we talk about icons of Christ, um, and, and that's you know central in the Eastern traditions, and as I said, Christ is the visible image of the Father. That's how Christian theologians will speak. Um, 
we're talking about uh, an, encou- an encounter with Jesus Christ. The, the icon or the image can mediate an interpersonal, interpersonal uh, relationship. And that's received as gift. You know, and then there's a sort of a, a further sort of dimension as to, you know, uh, what is the intentionality behind the production of those images? And, and yeah, I mean, uh, can they be manipulated? Uh, most definitely. Um, it, but they, ha- they also have to be defined, right? You know, you can't go to a random person and give them a figurine. They do need to be explained to, right? Like they... You need to tell them that this, right? Like if you go to North Korea and, and you see a picture of Kim Jong Un right now, but you don't know the political sort of environment, then it's just a weird picture of a weird dude, right? Uh, yeah. So sim. Yeah, you're, you're right. Symbols only make sense within a broader sort of cultural context, right? Um, within a broader set of meanings and and sort of values that are particular to to a particular cultural context. Um, you know. Uh, a red rose, for example, you know, just as an image is very clearly um, not just a simple sign. There's a deeper sort of surplus of meaning there, you know, and for most people, it means something around love. <laughs> you know what I mean? But for the, the person who hasn't, you know, been raised in a cultural context where roses mean love and you receive roses as a gift, I mean, it's not really going to mean that much to you, for example, right? You won't really understand. You won't really understand that. And I think the King John Ung uh, you know, example is interesting because the American flag is very similar, right? I mean, that's a symbol, but it has very different meanings um, for different people around the world. For some, it means freedom. Others, it means oppression. Um, and so that's all coded. Yeah, that's all coded. And so you're right that in the sense that to get into the world of religious imagery and iconography in general, yeah, all of that only makes sense within a sort of um, a, a broader sort of worldview, Um where meanings and values are, are sort of, are fixed. Yeah. I, I was reading, um, that book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you know, and, uh, one of the things that he comes up with, which I think is fascinating is, uh, like the social development of, let's say culture. So you go from hunter gatherer, nomadic, uh, things, and they create little, uh, social tribes, and then they build, I can't remember the exact order, but it's like a, a town, a village. So there's these sort of stratifications depending on the complexity and size of their community. But he brings up um, that, I can't. I, maybe it's at the city or the town, whatever that designation is, it, he's got a number. It's like, if there are more than 3,000 people or whatever, the, uh, the human sort of, let's say, brain can't comprehend anymore the small-time mentality of knowing everybody by name, understanding the relationships between parties, and inevitably war and violence breaks out again. So you start off in the state where, uh, you know, like a nomadic tribe meets another, they're always killing each other, and then they become sedentary, and they find a way to coexist, but it generally is leveraged on relationships. So maybe, you know, your mother or your dad will come in and be like, you guys are blood-related, so you guys need to just cool it. And then as it gets more and more complex, um, people get a little bit farther apart and war breaks out again. And then he posits that that's where uh, politics, social hierarchy, and religion appear. Um, And it's this iconography and this implied social meeting that begins to give these societies the ability um, to exist. So we need like an overarching sense of the rules. And I think you know, or I'm thinking, what is the role that imagery, iconography, and all this stuff has in uh, kind of just telling people to to be more obedient uh, and to just listen to what used to be a single tone message? So religion might be like, uh, stop murdering each other and try to be nice to each other. Um, I think that's getting twisted a lot. And you brought up it, like the intent of how you present it and build images is going to have an effect. But um, it just makes me think too much as usual um, about how controlling all of this stuff uh, can be, maybe. Maybe that'll be the softer way instead of just saying that it is inherently um, negative. Um, yeah, I mean, I think symbols are pregnant with meaning. Um, and, uh, you know, that meaning can be, you know, fixed in different ways by different cultural contexts. I mean, from a Christian perspective, 
we might say, uh, we might make a distinction between, for example, uh, you know, uh, sin and grace, you know, what, you know, what ought to be the case and what isn't the case, you know, where there's a failure to sort of uh, live as one ought to live. And, and so, you know, sin and grace, you know, the dialectic between sin and grace in, infects, you know, everything. I mean, so all of human history is a mixture of those two dynamics um, of progress and sort of decline and redemption as well. And, uh, you know, so there, it's an anthropological constant that, you know, we are, as humans, are symbol sort of, you know, symbol making beings. Um, and that sort of cultural meanings and values are communicated in and through symbols. And uh, that can be done in very different ways. Do you have a sense of how the images have evolved that have represented things like, uh, like grace and sin and redemption? Because uh, I'd be interested even today, like in the 2020 now, what, let's say, the Catholic Church would deem an appropriate image of even, of even Jesus Christ, I mean... Do you have a sense that that's changed a lot? It's hard. I, like, I mean, art history is maybe a better place to ask this question, but um, even within the time and energy you've spent studying this, do you think that that imagery has evolved? To... Yeah, I mean, it's most definitely evolved. And I think, um, I, I mean, the example of the sort of white, you know, blue-haired, uh, you know, uh, Jesus is an interesting one. I mean, it's a really good example of what you've just been describing, the way in which it, the, the meaning of images is you know, at least partially fixed by the, fixed by the, you know, the, the cultural context, right, in which those images uh, find themselves. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that says a lot about how certain people think about the nature of Christianity and about who Jesus Christ is when he's always depicted in that particular way. I think the gospel, you know, um, you know, theology is a mediation between the gospel and different cultural contexts. And it's what makes the gospel sort of relevant in different times and different places. And so, you know, uh, for a very long time, you know, Christians thought, well, there's only one way to portray sort of Jesus, or not, not to say there was only one way, but, you know, there was certain defined ways to sort of portray Jesus and Mary and so on and so forth. Um, but I think theologians and, and artists, you know, um, particularly in the global south now, are very comfortable bringing the gospel into dialogue with their own times and places. And so they'll portray Jesus in very different ways, whether as, um, you know, uh, as a First Nations uh, person or, you know, as a black liberator in certain contexts, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, um, that's one way in which uh, the tradition develops as the gospel is being brought into dialogue with different contexts. Um, yeah. I mean, I think for a very long time the, the you know, the Catholic Church was very wary of sort of modern art because they, they saw modern art as being some, something less than sacramental in the deeper sense that I've been sort of speaking about, um, you know, as, as almost sort of idolatrous, as focused on the image itself and, and on sort of uh, as being sort of anthropocentric. Um, and so the Catholic Church really was, you know, institutionally was hesitant to sort of embrace um, different ways of yeah, modern art in general. And I would say that that's not unrelated to this fear um, around um, the loss of the sacramental uh, sensibility. And so for a very long time, you, I mean, even now today, most of the Christian art you see is, is old art. You know what I mean? It's, it's it, you know, um, it's from a previous age. And there's really not, I mean, you, there, there are obviously modern Christian artists who are, um, very much in dialogue with uh, contemporary trends, but there's not a lot of them, I would say, but I'm not an expert. You know, it sounds like a rambling yeah. mess, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is perfect uh, because this is why we get along. And also, you know what? I, I think I agree just because again, topically I am not a, uh, I am not an art historian. So uh, I also have the same impression as you that, in, in the Christian idea, if the image exists to point you towards God's spirituality or something greater than yourself, then a church will find their sort of a greater power to that. But the fears that imagery that points to oneself, the Freudian idea of the ego or pride or, you know, the sins are generally uh, self-facing um, thought, thought processes, that, that a church group would find that... Um, frightening if not i mean never mind the deeper stuff with sin and, and damning people to hell and all that kind of like really dramatic shit 
but they're scared of the implications of the power of images to um, to make people uh, selfish really, and self-absorbed. Um, and and I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, from yeah, I mean, again, not an expert in this area, but yeah, what you're describing makes sense to me. Do people modern or reasonably contemporary religious thinkers, you know, comment on the the current social status? You know, are, are, are clearly, for example, on the top public level, the Catholic Church is very always concerned about how they fit in with the modern world and you have such strong tonal changes and then but we, I feel like I don't know maybe this is just us being childish but it feels like every 10 years there's like a cultural problem <laughs> like globally uh, in the time that we've existed uh, um, so yeah like how's how's let's say Christianity with that I mean is there inner dialogue as far as you're aware of that that there's something different about the way people are dealing with uh, you know, fear and faith right now versus uh, maybe the dogma of uh, you know the 1500s and how Catholic thinking was written at that time. Uh, I mean, it's a weird question, but... It's a big know. one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's a big one. I mean, I hear you asking about the relationship between you know, the Catholic Church in the modern world, which is, is a very big question. I mean, that's kind of what you're, you're curious about. Yes. I mean, less so to evaluate the Catholic Church and more just to get an idea of uh, what, let's say, f faithful or religious um, institutions, how, let's say, how they're perceiving what's going on in the world today. And... Uh, and by that you mean co in you mean COVID mind. in particular, or broader no, sort of? I mean, I mean COVID is a good example only, perhaps in my mind. In um, you know, if the Catholic Church, let's say, or Christianity or, or Christian thinkers have an opinion about COVID, that can be a reflection of how people today are dealing with it versus what they think they should be doing. I think that'd be interesting because, uh, you know, ultimately I want to bring this all back to my worry which is kind of what you brought up that images particularly through photography have taken over and they're no longer uh, i don't remember the word we just used but they no longer point towards spirituality greater purpose social norms uh, they're just being used for oneself and i think it's corrupting and dangerous i sound like an old man well i hear you thing. also saying that they're not just you they're, they're also being used potentially um by different sort of political projects i hear you saying as well yes yeah um and they're and so you know images are you know the meaning of these images are being manipulated in order to you know serve a, a particular hegemonic formation or project um so it's not just a fear that you know uh, it's become all about the self it's it's also uh, I hear you saying that images are being used, you know, in biased ways to, um, yeah, to basically shape people, positively or negatively. But uh, you're you're foregrounding the the potential negative sort of uh, dimension of that. Um, yeah, I think that. I mean, I think I think that makes sense as well. I I mean, uh, there's there's so <laughs> so much to go on here, Dave. I, I mean. Give me, give me, a, give me a, a concrete question, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump in <laughs> because otherwise I'm just going to ramble because there's so much going on. I mean, it's all good. It's all good. Um. All right. Yeah. Like, let's pick one. Because I think you can tell I have a tendency to ramble. No, rambling's good. I'm rambling. If we got to the point, we just go in, have one drink, and go home. But uh, that's not how. <laughs> well, that's that'd not how be no fun. Yeah, yeah, that'd be no fun either. Well, okay. Let's let's cut to the, that point then sort of like the politicization and the direction uh directional use of imagery so um you know it's hard of course to reflect on the history of let's say the church and how they intended to build an effigy in order to cow people <laughs> i mean we, we don't have a right i don't think to reflect on that uh, at least without maybe a panel discussion between art and religious historians but I do have that fear. I have that fear that uh, a politics and the greater, yeah, the greater structures, be they corporate or political, um, intentionally misuse and misconstrue pictures because 
they know that we will take them at faith for representing reality. Uh, so th for sure, I, I'm very worried about that. And I think um, post, let's say, World War II, out of photojournalism and into marketing and advertising, um, we certainly see, uh, at least if not the evil intent, the brutal sort of ramifications of learning the power of these images, which is frightening. Um, but in your thought, like the religious use of imagery it was never meant to be an accurate depiction of the world. It's meant to stir a different thought process, I wonder. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, take a look at icons in the East in, in general. I mean, they certainly don't look like real people. <laughs> I mean, in one sense, they're not really meant to, right? Um, I, I, I think I think there is a fear. I mean, you, I mean, to circle back to your question around the, the modern day Catholic Church and its sort of efforts to sort of, you know, uh, dialogue with um, the modern age, I mean, in general, I mean, I think there's two ways of living your life as as a Christian, I mean, just to simplify things, one way would be to sort of just go through the motions and, for example, to participate in Christian worship or the liturgy. What, what is liturgy? Well, it's, a sim, it's an entire symbol system, right? There's actions, there's images, there's words, um, you know, there's, um, you know, uh, yeah, it engages your, all of your senses in a sense. And um, that's meant to mediate an encounter with God. Many people don't have that that deeper sort of uh, symbolic sort of consciousness. They don't really ever see below the you know below the surface um, to that deeper sort of depth depth dimension. So religion for them is just a matter of going through the motions, um, you know, and following rules and maybe even beating others over the head with those rules because in in a sense they've sacralized, um, they've made sort of uh, idols out of certain beliefs. Um, and have missed that deeper dimension, namely that, you know, the symbol system, for example, of, of Christian worship or the liturgy is meant to mediate a deeper encounter with Jesus Christ. And uh, all authentic religion, or I mean, at least authentic Christian religion requires that. But, you know, many, many Christians, I mean, we've been, you know, our, our sense of symbolic consciousness has been deadened by the modern age in which we live. Everything is very surface level. Um, reality is what I can touch and see um, and hear. Um, and uh, the sacramental sense sensibility is saying that reality is something so much deeper than that. And uh, the, so, the, you know, the, the institutional church, modern day Catholics are not immune to that trend. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not very difficult to, uh, you know, to go and poll a bunch of Christians who say, yeah, I just go to church. I just do these things. I believe these rules. And religion for them is not really ever alive. They've never actually had the encounter with God um, that is meant to be at the core of all of that. Do you think, so this uh, philosopher I found, Willem Foster, he brought up this idea that uh, one of the biggest problems happened with the, I don't know if it's rationalist, I don't remember, but Descartes moving forward where, like you're describing, so much emphasis became, yeah, even empiricism, like this idea that I have to be able to uh, physically interact with it. Uh, it has to be, quote, on air quote, scientific for it to be reality. Whereas, you know, spiritualism and religion at its core uh, always posits the opposite, that reality as we sense it is essentially illusory <laughs> and greater faith and deeper sort of spiritual connection um, should be more real for a lack of a better and more adept phrasing. It's it's uh, something that I've been bending the other way to with my recent um, sort of let's call it spiritual rebirth and, and new discovery and trying like new lines of thinking uh, to get away from this idea that I have to, um, I don't know, like play God and determine that this is real because I poked it and everything else you say is wrong because I can't touch it. Um, but there's something weird that's happened culturally over the history of philosophy, I think that might uh, contribute to this thing because like you're saying we i mean we're going to use the term surface level um it is a very judgmental term um you know if we go let's say to uh, a class that you're teaching out of however many kids you know uh, let's say in a first year introductory philosophy and religion course um, you know what is the percentage of people that are going to have a, a deeper spiritual religious experience i mean i don't know like you know at that point it's just um, 
let's call it devil's I, advocate. But uh, I mean, I think it. Uh, do you want me to jump in there or no? Oh, well, mean, yeah, go, go, go. I, I think it's a great question. I think, I, mean, I think that's a really good question. I think, um, you know, from from my perspective, when I teach, for example, uh, world religions class, you know, and the vast majority of my students are Christian uh, or have been raised Catholic. More specifically, they come into that class and they think they understand what you know Christianity is all about. Um, and, and for many of them, they have some idea of, you know, who Jesus is, and, and they have some under, basic understanding of Christian symbols, including images. Um, but, uh, you know, again, they've, you know, whether or not they've actually had the experience of encounter with God, they can't really pinpoint it in their actual experience. Do you know what I mean? So, many of them do live sort of, it's a going through the motions. They were raised to be Christian. They participate in all of these rituals and in and through that participation, they've, you know, they've internalized some of those meanings and values, but it really hasn't ever come alive for them or it has, but they just haven't been able to connect the dots because, you know, everybody's told them that reality is precisely what you can sense and touch and feel and taste or see or smell. And, um, there's nothing deeper than that. Um, but, you know, when I peel that back for them and we sort of talk about, well, you know, give, to give you some examples, and these are examples that I've used in, in classes before and, you know, in retreats and so on. Uh, I mean, you know, think of uh, a beautiful sunset. Think of, you know, uh, your favorite sort of piece of art, for example, um, if we're going to go with images. But, I mean, you can think of the sunset as an image, I mean, right? Um, or holding a newborn baby or, you know, listening to your favorite music or sitting with, family and friends at dinner, um, and that there's a, there, you know, in and through these experiences, uh, everyday sort of experiences, uh, we can encounter the uh, sort of sacred mystery, that all of these everyday sort of experiences are potentially doors to the sacred, and that, you know, uh, this experience of the sacred comes to us freely as gift. Um, and, you know, Bernard Lonergan talks about how, you know, different, obviously, philosophers and theologians will talk about this experience in different ways. Lonergan talks about it as an experience of unrestricted being in love, right? It's an experience, we don't work for it, it's not a reward for, you know, doing certain things. It, it overcomes us freely as gift, and it, it, we, it, it's experienced as a foretaste of whatever would fulfill us completely. It's a, it's a tiny little taste of what complete fulfillment or ultimate sort of happiness um, would look like. And we get a taste of that, and it, it, it's given to us freely as gift. Um, and, and, and that's how religious symbols are, are meant to operate for Lonergan, right? They're meant to mediate this encounter, and the experience of that encounter is an experience of fulfillment. It's a tiny little taste of whatever would fulfill your desire for happiness, for fulfillment completely. Um, and, you know, many students who have been, you know, uh, embraced the sort of scientific in the pejorative sense mindset, the sort of materialist mindset, have these experiences, they're just not able to identify them and to name them for what they are. Um, and so they sort of explain them away. Um, but I think w when you're able to sit with students and, and, and to sort of help them sort of take a step back and think about these types of experiences in their lives and where they might have had them, and get them to be able to describe the, the way they felt and so on, um, they actually end up connecting in a lived way, in a real lived and authentic way, with the tradition that they were raised to, you know, sort of practice without any real deeper connection, right? And I think that's the case for most, many, well, I don't want to say most, many religious people, people who are raised in a particular religious tradition, only later come to an experience, a real experience, right? The, the sort of encounter that underlies everything that that religious tradition is about. Um, and until then, religion is not really alive. Here's a message from one of our sponsors. This episode of My Viewfinder is brought to you by the Calgary Foundation. Whether it's funding anti-racism programs, addiction recovery, or food hampers for the hungry, for 65 years, the Calgary Foundation has proudly supported the charitable community to address some of Calgary's biggest challenges. Now, during this period of unprecedented urgent needs, Calgary Foundation renewed its commitment to building a healthy, vibrant, giving, caring, and resilient community. If you're a registered charity looking for a grant, a professional advisor creating a giving plan for your client, 
or a donor wanting to give back to your community, discover a wealth of resources at calgaryfoundation.org and learn more about their work through Calgary Foundation's